Hello everybody, I'm Judith Harwin and I'm Professor of Socio-Legal Studies at Lancaster University where I also co-direct the Centre for Child and Family Justice Research. We're absolutely thrilled that so many people have registered for this event. We have in our Together we have lawyers, social workers, academics, kinship carers from both England and Wales. We see you all as a crucial part of this Agenda for Change event. You are part of the Agenda for Change. The event results from work that has been done in the partnership between Quorum, BAF and Kinship. This has been a very long-standing relationship now that grew out of work around the children who were placed on special guardianship orders following care proceedings and we identified that there were serious issues around both policy and practice and how that should be handled. Today we're going to concentrate particularly on the agenda for change. There were many other issues that we could have concentrated on, but this seems to be the most important issue. We're honored and we're delighted to have such a superb group of speakers who are going to share their thoughts with us for this agenda for change. Firstly, we'll be beginning with Sir Andrew McFarlane, who's president of the family division. He'll then be followed by Josh McAllister, who's been the recently announced chair of the Independent Children's Social Care Review. He'll be followed by Maxine Campbell, who is a special guardian and a project worker. And she will be having a conversation with Krish Kandaya, who is the new chair of the Adoption and Special Guardianship Leadership Board. Maxine works at Kinship. Then we have Steve Walker, and Steve Walker was the driver for the improvements that were made in Leeds City Council's approach to managing kinship care and prioritising how it could work better. And finally, I will speak. The sessions are going to be introduced by me and Lucy Peake and who's the chief executive of Kinship and John Simmons, who's the director of policy research and development at Quorum Bath. They are going to be dealing with the Q&A session and we hope that we have lots of questions coming from you. We wanted to capture really some of the work that we have done over these last few years and are going to start with showing an extract from a first film that we made which we feel was captures exactly what the issues are for special guardians. They are going to be talking and telling you how it is for them. We'll also be showing you at the end of the event, our latest film, which captures the views of the professionals and sets out that agenda for change. Both films are available on YouTube. So we would also like particularly to thank Rich Berry, who was our filmmaker. He was fantastic and was patient and we feel captured all the difficult messages that needed to come across brilliantly. As part of this, we wanted to develop something that went on beyond the event and went wider than the film. So we've developed a resource pack, which also includes the relevant case law that's been prepared by the former president, Sir James Mumby and his colleague, now we know we've got an awful lot to cover today and we know that there's really a lot to discuss so we see this event as just the beginning. We also know that there's a huge impetus to address the priorities for change as we're dealing with some of the most disadvantaged children in society who've suffered from abuse and neglect. So please do post your questions to us. 
through the Q&A function, and they will be put to the speakers and panelists. And we're delighted that Josh, Krish, Maxine, Steve, and Mr. Justice Kean, who's the chair of the Public Law Working Group, will be available to take your questions. I've just got one housekeeping point to make, and that is to say that this event is being recorded. So now we're ready to start, and I'm delighted to begin the event with an extract from the first film, The First Day of Forever, where five guardians share their experiences and set out their priorities for change. In 2019, more children left care on a special guardianship order than through an adoption order. What, what would you say if you describe in three words? Terrible. Would you? You wouldn't say terrible. The process, yeah. It's appalling. There was never a, a shiny book that said, welcome to potentially being a kinship carer. And for us, it was a case of genuinely Googling yeah, our way through the whole process. You know, he was saying to lots of people, I want to live with Nanny and Grandad for all the days. Punched me in the face with when I was holding TG. You just, a nod and dog. Okay, you want me to do that? Okay. And you just think, oh, give us a break. You know, we're trying to do the right, the thing, right thing. And you feel like you're being clobbered all the time for it. Special Guardians have shared a really powerful set of messages with us in this film. And these messages are consistent with research. It's clear that they need more support. I see her strength, I see her power, I see her, her tenacious personality. Um, yeah, I, I just see great things for her. You tend to think that there's nobody, you're the only one that's going through all this, and you're not. You've, you've talked to it brilliantly. That's fair. It's all right. <laughs> Thank you. So that gives you a little bit of the flavour of the film, and it really is just a little bit of the flavour. The film is hard hitting. So now I would like to introduce Sir Andrew McFarlane, President of the Family Division. We're extremely grateful to you, Sir Andrew, for introducing this session. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. For children who cannot go back to their mother or their father because of circumstances that have led them coming into care, it is, of course, crucial that they find a permanent home with individuals who will give safe and loving care on a long-term, open-ended basis for them. Some don't achieve this. Some uh, are in foster care or uh, other institutional care. But our aspiration for all of these children must be to find a permanent home for them where they can't return to their parents' care. That's a given, I suspect, for everyone who is listening to what I say. But achieving it is hard. Uh, we are fortunate, in my view, in having the special guardianship provisions now in force for some 15 years. Uh, on the statute book, and clearly working to a degree that was never achieved by their forebears, the custodianship uh, orders. Special guardianship orders have developed and are now, as the statistic in the film shows, uh, being used on a, a widespread basis uh, throughout the care system. But the fact that they're being used doesn't mean that we're getting it right for the children, getting it right for the special guardians. Uh, and I see this research and this evening's event as being part of a process of focusing on how we can do things more effectively for the children. Uh, many of you who are taking part in this webinar will, I have hope, I hope took part in the uh, Family Justice Council uh, events of two or three weeks ago, where over the course of uh, three evenings, we looked at adoption uh, in um, 2021 and going forward. Those were interesting uh, 
address is by some nine or ten people, they demonstrated that our concepts of adoption don't stand still. They they develop, they they change, and it's right that they they do. This evening's event is the companion piece, as it were. What do we do for the children who can't go home but can't be adopted, or for whom it's not right that they should be adopted, for whom they can find a permanent place uh, in their natural family? The Public Law Working Group was persuaded early on that there was a need to focus on uh, special guardianship orders and produce guidance for that area of the work, uh, whatever else was looked at in relation to the mainstream operation of the care system. And they were right to take up that challenge and make their recommendations. Uh, you'll be familiar with the recommendations. If I can crystallize them into a, a phrase, it's the rather hackneyed expression, time spent in reconnaissance is never wasted. I fear that many people who come forward as special guardians do so late on in care proceedings and at a time when uh, there hasn't been the opportunity because of the circumstances to look at the offer that they are making to care for uh, young people as fully as it should be looked at. There is uh, a rate of failure of special guardianship placements that might be avoided if more thorough uh, assessments were undertaken. And so the recommendations for change are, are uh, clear and they're strong. They are for more robust and comprehensive assessments and support plans at the start, looking at the relationship between the child and the special guardian, placing uh, the children with special guardians on an interim basis before a final order is made, and looking at the support services. The short clip we've just seen of the film really indicates very clearly, sadly, that the individuals that we saw were unprepared uh, and felt disengaged from the process, and yet they were being asked to be the main players uh, in the uh, development of the child's uh, future placement. And so the second recommendation is better training and preparation for special guardians. And then also, crucially, uh, an emphasis on parental contact. Parental contact was an element that also featured prominently in the Family Justice Council uh, seminars in connection uh, with uh, adoption. One of the interesting and exciting things about family law is that it never really sits still long enough to have its photograph taken. It's always developing. developing. The black letter law for special guardianship now 15 uh, years old and, and adoption similarly is developing, not because the law is developing, but because our insight into how it works and how we can improve what we deliver for these children who desperately need uh, love and permanence, security, stability uh, in a home when they cannot go home to their mother and father. What they want is an ordinary, boring childhood. Being a child is blooming difficult enough uh, without having uncertainty, insecurity, instability, uh, and um, uh, lack of safety uh, uh, around you. So these are simple aspirations, but they're hard to achieve. I'm very grateful to the agencies that have come together to give prominence now to the need to change uh, and um, uh, gear up what we do for special guardians to uh, make it more likely that when the court does choose a placement for a special guardianship order, it will be the right placement for the child and the right placement for the special guardians. And we'll see the child settling and living in that family for many years to come. Now that's all I want to say. That wasn't even a trailer for what I wanted to say. That is what I have said. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sir Andrew. That was a wonderful opening to the event and setting out the issues and identifying a bit about the both the aspirations and the specifics of best practice guidance. And we know that Mike Keen will be picking up or have the opportunity to pick up later and develop that further. So now I would like to pass on to Josh McAllister and ask you, Josh, to set out the key priorities and how you see the issues. Thanks, Judith, and uh, welcome to the 635 and rising um, people who are um, at this meeting. Two weeks ago, I started 
to chair the independent review into children's social care in England. And for me, this is about sitting with a really big question, which is how do we best ensure that children grow up in loving, stable and safe families? And when that's not possible, that care provides the same foundations. Now, uh, this big question will be the focus of the independent review into children's social care and answering it with some recommendations will be what I'm spending um, the next year at least doing. But we can only answer this by listening deeply and thinking boldly. And from the very beginning, I've been clear that experts by experience, those who have had personal experience of children's social care in a whole range of different ways, must be at the centre of this listening and thinking. And that includes kinship carers, specifically special guardians, and the children that they're raising, um, a group that can sometimes be um, far too easily overlooked. The review, as I say, will take place over the next 12 to 15 months, uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing opportunities with all of you in the coming days that will allow you to contribute directly to that review. And there'll be specific opportunities for kinship carers and special guardians to engage in the work. You can sign up for updates from the review so that you'll get an email when those opportunities are live. And I'll just post the link to that in the chat um, function now so that you can sign up. I've watched the first day of Forever film uh, twice now. I watched it first in January and again this morning. And I found hearing from the experiences of Tom, Barbara, Gillian, Maxine, Stacy, and her twin sister, Grace, incredibly moving. They show that we have got a lot more to do to make sure that we've got the back of those taking on the life-changing responsibility of becoming a special guardian. Kinship carers often have to navigate and reset existing family relationships at the same time as being the solid rock for their grandchildren, nieces and nephews and other kin. Navigating proceedings, new vocabulary, a new set of professionals, uh, the concept of family time or contact, support plans, peer support. There is a big room for improvement and I'm sure there will be examples in the review that we're doing of excellent practice for us to highlight. It is very much my hope that the review, by looking at the whole of the children's social care system and our collective responsibilities as neighbours, family members, parents ourselves, friends, government and as fellow citizens, will lead to a positive reset in support for families in all shapes and sizes, including special guardians. So please contribute to the review over the coming months. Um, whether you're a social worker, um, work in the law, uh, or are indeed a special guardian yourself. And a final note of thanks from me to all of you on this call, in particular those of you who are special guardians and kinship carers and those directly supporting them, because I think the last 12 months has probably thrown a whole additional bunch of challenges your way um, in doing what is... Um, uh, taking on a responsibility that leaves me um, with a sense of wonderment at your um, stepping into uh, the, the breach um, when, when families are struggling. So a huge thank you from me um, to you and uh, look forward to hearing from the rest of the panel. Thank you, Josh. Um, my name is Lucy Peake. I'm the Chief Executive at Kinship and it is really encouraging to hear you talk about kinship carers and special guardians in the way that you just have and for you to set out your commitment to hear from them and their experiences because as you said they are so often neglected and the reviews that have taken place so far by government have not included kinship care and so you know we are really um, delighted that we have a kinship carer on the expert by experience group and that you are reaching out to kinship carers and special guardians and acknowledging the critical role that they play. Um, I am going to move on now um, and introduce you to our next speakers. So I'm going to introduce you to Chris Kandaya, who is the chair of the Adoption and Special Guardianship Leadership Board, and Maxine Campbell, who is a special guardian and a project worker at Kinship. And I'm also delighted that Maxine is a member of the new special guardian reference group that Chris has established very quickly 
to help support the work that he's doing around special guardianship with the board. So I'm going to hand over to Chris and Maxine. Thank you, Lucy. Good evening, everybody. Uh, you're in for a treat. You're going to get to meet Maxine, who, as Lucy said, is a, a member of the Special Guardian Reference Group, which we've set up because we really think hearing from Special Guardians should inform policy and practice uh, in this area. Maxine, I I've heard a little bit of your story. W would you be up for sharing it uh, with the 644 people that are on this call? How did you become a Special Guardian? Sure. Um, I don't want to echo what's already in the film, and I encourage everybody to watch it when they get an opportunity to. Um, but the process has been quite fraught um, from the offset. Um, I was originally approached on a temporary basis um, to look after, at the time, an unborn child. Um, and I was very willing to go along with that process. Um, but along the way, um, there was very little advice. Thankfully, I was an informed person uh, because this has already happened in our family. And uh, thankfully I knew about Grandparents Plus at the time now known as Kinship and also the Family Rights Group. So I was able to access information, but even in accessing information back then, I don't know if I knew all the right questions to ask about the future because the feedback that I got um, from social work teams at the time was that they were going to be there to help and support us. So with that in mind, um, I, I kind of wrote off a lot of things because I thought it was taken care of, housing issues. I was in a one bedroom flat um, and we remained in a one bedroom flat, sleeping in the same bed for seven years. Um, as most people on here will know that children that are permanently placed suffer with attachment issues, you know, and that didn't feed well into how she became attached and, and building on, on her attachment. Um, you know, there was issues around work and not being able to take unpaid, unpaid leave. And my employers uh, were mistaken in thinking that I was entitled to it and it wasn't until the 11th hour I was told actually I'm not. Um, and then had to take a year off unpaid. Um, and when you're in the middle of your life and you've got plans, those things are really, really difficult. Um, and, and I think one of the most difficult things was just navigating a system that wasn't coherent. Um, I could ask person A one, uh, a question and I could ask person B the sa very same question from the same um, you know, corners, and I would get very, very different answers. And uh, that was really problematic. And, and being a project worker now, and speaking to so many special guardians and kinship carers as I do, you know, what distresses me is that actually I hear echoes constantly of the same thing that I experienced nine years ago. Has kinship care made headway? Absolutely. The fact that I'm in the role that I am today, um, you know, we, we have, definitely have, but there's such a way to go. Um, people need help with support in schools. They need help with support with, um, you know, just dealing with attachment and even how to communicate with the child about their story. You know, at the moment I'm doing a, a, a project on, on life story, how to approach that with uh, people in my support group and they've all come to me and they said oh thank goodness for that because we had no idea how to approach this and there's very little on offer from the local authorities and um, so we're doing a bit of hand holding with each other but for me personally you know my story is complicated I'm, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs I just encourage everybody to watch the movie um, but it doesn't end with what's in that film you know, the things that happen are constant. As somebody mentioned earlier, you know, being in this lockdown um, has thrown up so many different things. It's funny, last night I went into, I call her my daughter because she's been with me since she was a baby. And I went into her room and she's got a whiteboard in there. And on that whiteboard, she had written on there and I could just about make it out. Look for my brother, look for my sister and look for my dad. 
And at the bottom, she wrote, I found my dad on Facebook. And, and, and that occurred very recently. She's only nine, but you know, she, she hasn't got a Facebook account, but she knows how to Google. Um, you know, so these are the issues that, that emerge for us. And not all of us have great relationships with the birth family. Um, so it does make things very complicated. Thank you, Maxine. And, and that real life experience really helps to shape this conversation for all of us that sometimes we just see statistics, but you're telling us a real life story. So thank, thank you for that. F from your experience, if you could change three things in this system to make life better for special guardians and the children that they look after, what, what would you want to put on the top of your list? I've actually got four. I'm going to be cheeky. I do have, <laughs> I've, actually, I've got a long list. I've probably got, you know, the A to Z and back again. Um, but I'm going to give you four of them. And the first one is support for, for special guardians and kinship carers from the point of assessment, from the point of the introduction to the notion that you're going to take on somebody else's child, that support should be there in place for you. So you're you're teamed with somebody, an expert. Um, and when I say an expert, I, um, someone like myself, you know, somebody that's been through the process, somebody that sees the process from the inside and, and has had to navigate it, um, you know, support in going through that, knowing the right questions to ask, um, challenging those answers that actually, um, you know, don't appear to be the right answer at the time because that does come up. Um, and, you know, through the, the assessment, being party to proceedings in court, I wasn't party to my proceedings. You know, I, was, I sat outside a room while they made decisions about my life going forward. It was crazy. Um, so that's my first one. My second one um, would be to be entitled to financial support, which includes paid time off work in par with adoption. And, um, you know, it came as quite a shock for me that I wasn't entitled to that. I thought, hold on a minute, I'm doing exactly the same thing that an adopter is doing here. Um, and in my case, um, I, I felt very much like an adopter because my situation wasn't that I had a great relationship with, with, with my sister. And um, so, you know, we, we definitely weren't going to live within each other's constructs. So, you know, I needed time off to be able to, you know, settle this child. Um, the first night she lived with me was the first night she stayed in my house and it shouldn't be like that. Um, my third one is to um, have support managing contact. Um, for myself, I, you know, I'm, I'm quite good at being able to advocate for myself, but I work with lots of special guardians and kinship carers that are not able to do that. And uh, they, they feel that sometimes when in, this, in a support plan, if contact has been included, that that is what they have to do, even when you're seeing the fallout afterwards and when I say the fallout behavior issues which could be leading up to the contact could be after the contact and there always seems to be a great emphasis and need of the of the parent rather than the emphasis on the need of the child and I really would like people to think about that because actually especially when they're very young and they don't have a voice it comes out in behavior and then that just makes it really challenging for for kinship carers and special guardians to be able to manage that. So definitely support. And lastly, um, for me will be um, education. I feel like the, throughout this whole process, I've had to educate almost everybody I come into contact with, whether it's been the judiciary, whether it's been the social work teams, whether it's been education departments or teachers, um, the DWP, I have to give an explanation from, from the beginning, you know, and I have to be very explicit about what's going on. You know, seven years it took me to battle to move out of mm. a one bedroom flat. Um, so yeah, Th Brilliant. those top four. 
I think they're brilliant and really helpful. And, and you're, you can definitely have a bonus extra because you're such a good advocate for the children in your care. Maxine, I believe you want to ask me some questions. So we'll flip the tables and, and uh, you can be the interviewer this time. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased, actually, Krish, that you're in this role, um, you know, and the special guardians of got a seat at this table to push forward change you know um, I really welcome that and I think um, one of the things that constantly comes up in my support groups and uh, my, my groups are really keen to know is what is going to change what is going to be the next steps mm. and for you in the role that you're in currently um, I know that you can only inform but what's on your agenda um, to inform the government about our needs? It's a brilliant question. So I am the chair of the Adoption and Special Guardianship Leadership Board. And the and special guardianship bit might not have received as much attention as it ought to have done over the years. Uh, and so I'm trying to flip the balance so that we make sure that special guardianship gets the attention that it needs. Uh, as was said in, uh, in the earlier comments from Professor uh, Judith, I think, um, more children are leaving care to special guardianship placements and to adoption. Um, and the support structures um, are not there in the same way that they are for adopters. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of the right outcome for children. Um, I, I'm not ideologically committed to any particular outcome. I'm thinking whatever's best for the child, that's the North Star that we uh, seek to focus on. And for many children, Going back to birth family is a fantastic option um, if the family can get the right kind of support. When that's not possible, kinship care has to be the top priority wherever that's placeable. Um, most of us on this call are potential um, special guardians because we have nephews and nieces and, and grandchildren uh, who we could willingly step in to care for. But if we didn't know the support was there, that's going to make it really hard for us to do so. So uh, I want to see special guardians getting the support that they can and I want to speak up for them. And that's why it's great to have you on our reference group. That's really important to me. I think the other thing um, I want to do is to kind of highlight best practice. Uh, and I came across um, some fantastic work going on in Shropshire. Shropshire Local Authority has levelled up uh, all the support that special guardians of previously looked after children are receiving, and they're matching the financial support that, uh, that foster carers would get and giving that to special guardians who are looking after uh, previously looked after children. And they've worked out it's actually saving them money as well as being a fantastic outcome for these children. I would love to see that normalised across the nation if that were possible. Um, people keep telling me this is a no brainer. We save money and we have better outcomes for children. I would love to see that practice uh, just become the norm. And we're using a little task group that Lucy uh, is chairing for us to look at how we can drive that change through. Wouldn't that be amazing? Oh, I'm hearing in the chat that Stoke do it too. Brilliant. If you've got other places that's happening, do let us know because we'd love to that to be the most normal way forward. Um, I think the, the other thing um, we're trying to do is highlight best practice and in kin on the kinship.org.uk website uh, we launched a special support guide recently that Mike Hall has pulled together and that's got some brilliant things that people are doing uh, and one of the things you mentioned was that support for contact and contact's really important when it's in the best interest of children but it needs to be supported and helped and so there's some really good advice uh, on that uh, resource there so we'd love to see that. And then as we have opportunity, we'd like to inform uh, legislation and policy. And it's great to see so many uh, lawyers and judges uh, joining us tonight. Um, we'd love to make sure that special guardians are getting the legal support that they need uh, as they're stepping up. Now, I think special guardians are the hidden heroes of the care system, actually. Um, and they need to get the support uh, in order to do that job well. Thank you, Chris. You, you know, I'm very thankful that everybody that's on here tonight um, can see and understand the needs of kinship carers, special guardians, the children involved, you know, and that we're being given this platform um, to be able to speak and, and to be able to try and, you know, highlight this agenda for change uh, for, for this area. You know, um, I, I just want to say uh, thank you for that, um, because as I, as I said, I've been in this now for coming on nine years and, um, you know, it has been a drip effect. 
Um, but in, re in the recent year or so, um, we're seeing a huge amount of change and interest and um, it's very welcomed. And I know people that attend my support groups, all the people that are on the kinship panel and, um, and also network um, will, will welcome this as well. Um, so thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Maxine. And thank you to everyone that's joined this call. Um, I, I, there's a favourite Banksy picture of, uh, of mine that came out during lockdown, and it's of a little child who's put away Batman and Superman, put them in a basket, and is holding up a nurse as his new superhero that he wants to champion. And um, we've, we've come to recognise the caring professions as absolutely full of heroes. Uh, sadly, we haven't celebrated social workers, family lawyers, judges in the same way. But all of us are trying to make sure that children get the best possible outcome. So well done for everyone for what you're doing. And it's great to be part of that team, helping children have great outcomes. OK, uh, so just, just to uh, step in, I'm John Simmons uh, from Cor and Bath um, that have been working uh, with uh, Judith um, and uh, Lucy from uh, Kinship. Um, so I just wanted to thank both Krish and Maxine for a really stimulating, thoughtful, reflective but also kind of urgent set of messages when it comes to the agenda for change. I think that you set this out in such a, a clear and, um, and, and important uh, way. So thank you very much for that um, indeed. Um, um, everything that you said will be written down and uh, noted. The issue is, can we get it to be acted upon? But that's, uh, that's very much our hope for this session uh, tonight. Uh, so we're now going to move um, uh, to hear from uh, Steve Walker. Um, uh, he uh, was uh, DCS in Leeds and is now uh, moved on to an improvement uh, role within um, uh, local authorities. And uh, um, he has a lot to say on our second film about uh, the changes that uh, he identified <laughs> and brought about um, in uh, Leeds City Council when it came to, or when it comes to uh, kinship uh, care. Um, and we don't often hear directly from the uh, uh, change agendas that uh, DCS is often put in place, uh, but they do. And uh, I think that uh, Steve will uh, convey just what an important uh, role um, he had in bringing about a local agenda for change with the very significant impact that it's had on kinship carers um, in Leeds okay. itself. Um, I'd like to, to start with a couple of uh, 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 minor but important points. The, the first is that, that Judas said that I was the, the driving force for, for change. Um, and John's uh, alluded to my role as deputy director and then, then director in Leeds. I certainly wasn't the, the driving force, but, but I was in the, the car. And a lot of the, the impetus for, for change came from our um, family placement uh, team uh, within Leeds who knew things were not working well for, for carers. So why, why did we rethink in, in uh, Leeds? And I think it's important to say this because we didn't start from a position of, of strength. Uh, in 2010, children's services in Leeds were judged by Ofsted as inadequate. Um, Leeds at that time had the second highest number of, of children looked after in the country. Uh, that was after Kent, where all the asylum seekers were arriving at that particular uh, point in time. The outcomes that we had for children that we brought into care were poor. Um, placement stability wasn't good. They experienced lots of changes of social worker and unsurprisingly, educational, health, social and emotional outcomes for our looked after children were not good. And in the previous four years, we doubled the number of children who were subject to child protection plan. And as mentioned, the, the reason for so many changes of social worker had you know we're down to vacancies and we between 20 and 25 percent uh, of agency social workers at that time i think the first challenge that that we encountered was actually our view of family was very negative uh, the problems that families were experiencing were seen very often as a result of individual failures of family members and structural issues such as poverty, were rarely acknowledged or referenced uh, in assessments uh, or plans. The language that was used around, around family were indicated that they were not a safe place for children to be. A lot of talk about risk, 
a lot of use of uh, terms like danger statements. Uh, and one of my favorites, which will be very familiar to all kinship carers, viability uh, assessments. And the point that I would make is that if it was necessary for my children to have gone to live with my mum, good luck to any social worker who was going to go out and assess my mum and tell her that she was viable or not. Um, so that language just indicated that we, we really viewed families in a less than positive way. We had a focus at the time on process rather than outcome. So if things weren't working, rather than look at what we need to change, we just move them up the process. Kinship care and special guardianship, as in many authorities, sadly, at the, at the time, uh, was seen as a cheap option. It was the carer choice. So therefore, if we would encourage you to do it, but we certainly wouldn't uh, support you. And that was evidence when I, when I discovered at the, the time in 2011 that our kinship care uh, team in Leeds uh, consisted of Bev, who had a caseload and a kid you know, of 220. She supported every kinship carer that we had. Uh, and we had no special guardianship order or a special guardianship order that was that really wasn't thought through and did not encourage uh, anybody to take out a special guardianship order. In, in looking at how we were approaching the, the issue, the first thing that we did was, was we actually recognised that families are the most valuable but underutilised resource that we have uh, in society. And that's not simply a moral or value-based uh, belief. It's what research tells us that outcomes for children who are placed where we manage to keep them within family are better uh, than when we place them uh, outside of family. We developed a clear vision in Leeds, which was we wanted to be a child-friendly city. If we wanted to be successful as a city, we had to be a city and an authority that was successful for children and that looked at all children, not just vulnerable children. We focused on outcomes to get us away from process. Yeah, we wanted all children in Leeds to be safe, to enjoy education, have the skills for life, to be make healthy lifestyle choices, to have fun, a bit too low that one for me, and to have voice and influence. We had a commitment to work with families rather than doing two or four. And we certainly had done two or four uh, kinship and special guardianship, uh, special guardians. We apologized, engaged and invested. We apologized because we got it wrong. Yeah, we got it wrong and special guardians have been telling us for some time it wasn't working and we hadn't been listening. Then we did an unusual thing for a local authority, having identified the problem, instead of going in the shed and crashing and banging for six months and coming out and presenting kinship carers and special guardians with our new plan, we actually spent time with them to say, right, let's, let's work with you to get it right. And we invested. And one of the things that we invested in was family group conferencing. We invested, we have the largest family group conferencing service uh, in England. Uh, any family in Leeds who, uh, where they may experience a statutory intervention, whether that's child protection or court, will be offered a family group conference. And the reason for that is we want to engage with families early for two reasons. To give families the opportunity to work together to solve the problem that family members are experiencing but where it's not going to be possible for for children to remain with their birth uh, parents and and they may need to be placed within that extended family to give the extended family time to think that through to make a considered uh, um, decision and for us yeah to think about the support that they will need currently but also going forward in the future. Uh, we now have said there have two kinship care teams. That's wrong. Yeah, we have three kinship care teams. So kinship care is not viewed in Leeds as a cheap option. Um, and I'm pleased to tell you, Krish, that, that like uh, other authorities uh, like Stoke, 
that was mentioned earlier. I think it was Shropshire. Apologies if I've got that right. We also match yeah, what we offer uh, to our foster carers. And we used uh, research, what kinship carers and special guardianships, uh, special guardians were telling us. It's not time limited. It's flexible and adaptable because the needs and circumstances of both children and special guardians change over time. And therefore it needs to be flexible to those changes in circumstances. Um, it offers a range of support, including support by experts, uh, but from experience such as kinship. And we've also used uh, a mockingbird uh, hub uh, with our, our kinship carers. We also worked very closely with the whole council to develop a leads offer for carers. And that includes housing and leisure, yet so that the kind of issue that we heard about earlier, yet was, was addressed from the get go. And we had a financial model, yeah, for, for doing this. this. This makes, as Chris was saying, it makes financial sense that if you get the practice right, you get the outcome right for children. If you get the outcomes right, the money follows. But don't start with the money. And sadly, because of the pressures on local authorities, that's where many have been. And just finally, last slide, in terms of just the impact very quickly, I'm aware, Judith, yeah, we've significantly increased the number of special guardians and young people that we've, that we've got. We've 250 kinship carers, 608 special guardians, households and leads caring for 108 children that would all most likely be in care if we weren't doing that. We've improved the support and stability for children, young people and the carers. We've improved health, education, social, emotional outcomes for uh, children looked after and also care leavers who are more likely to be stable and in touch with us. We've reduced the number of looked after children leads by 11%, saving us 12 million annually in placement costs. We've improved practice, where we now are one of the best for recruitment and retention of social workers, because this is how social workers want to practice. And that saved us 5 million annually yeah, in agency fees. We've halved the number of children subject to child protection plan. And in doing it, because we're getting the practice right, Ofsted judged us as good in 2015 and outstanding 2018. The one thing I would just mention is that we're working with colleagues across West Yorkshire to try and develop a West Yorkshire special guardianship offer, yeah, so that we're consistent across West Yorkshire. But I think we need to be a little bit more ambitious and be looking at having an offer that addresses all of those issues nationally, rather than doing it at a local or regional basis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was a brilliant talk. And what you have done, I think, is show so clearly, along with some of the other authorities that we've heard about, that it is possible to make these changes and to invest in special guardianship properly with such positive outcomes. That's hugely important. I now want to build on what you've said and to have a look at what the research evidence can contribute. Thank you. So let's move straight from that opening slide to what I want to say. So next slide, please. The key question that I want to address is what is the contribution of research to the change agenda? And my starting point is that we do have good research. It's modest, but it's consistent that is showing that special guardianship is making a positive contribution to children's well-being, their stability, and that it prevents their return to court. For every 100 children whose care proceedings end with a special guardianship order, only five of those children will return to court within five years due to further significant harm. That's a really important point. The, we can look at some other outcomes 
The DfE has shown very clearly from its own educational data that children who are placed with special guardians have better educational attainment results than children who are looked after. Those results are put alongside the results for adopters and also children who are on care on the child arrangement orders. And it's a pity that we can't disaggregate that data, but the key point is their educational attainment is better. Earlier research by Jim Wade has drawn attention to other advantages. Children feel that they are able to put down roots and that they have a sense of belonging with their families. And likewise, special guardians tell us that the order gives them the legal security that they need to parent. When there are difficult contact issues, that's a particularly important finding. But sadly, we are not making the best use of wider research findings to support special guardianship properly. We've heard a lot about the financial hardships, the housing difficulties that special guardians face and their need for proper support. If we look at the wider literature on impacts of poverty and deprivation, we must ask the question, why are we not doing more to support families? Because the fact is that poverty and deprivation damage children's child development and their health and have longer term repercussions into adulthood. So that is a first thing that we are not really taking on board. The second one is around therapeutic support. There is a finding that I do find very troubling. And we have all said we want to be more ambitious in our aims to support special guardianship properly. The fact is that at the moment, the evidence shows that only nine to 10% of all special guardians in the last four years were allocated therapeutic support. The rest went to adopters. There may be many reasons for that, including the name of the support fund, Adoption Support Fund. It doesn't mention special guardians. They are invisible from that process, but it must concern us. So another concerning finding is that again, Jim Wade showed, and we showed in our own research at Lancaster, that special guardians felt emotional stress and strain from all the multiplicity of their problems that could cause issues like psychological problems, heightened anxiety and depression. We haven't sufficiently acted upon that as um, I have, I think, shown even from the previous point I've made. So let me then think about one more point about family. There's been very interesting recent research that demonstrates clearly that family is protective. The reasons are very complex, but there has been a longitudinal study that followed up children who, into their adulthood up to 30 years later from their placement either with a kinship family or who were placed in foster care or in residential care. And what it found is that children who remained within their, foster, their kinship families up to 30 years later were less likely to experience health difficulties and importantly were less likely to die as young as children who had been placed in residential care or foster care. So 
All those points put together suggest that special guardianship really is bringing many benefits, but we need to pay attention to the obstacles that it puts before families. Because there's one very simple consequence, and that is that potentially children who could be placed with special guardians, if they were supported properly, would not then need to go into foster care or residential care. I'm not, and I emphasize this, wanting to prioritize and say that one placement type is automatically superior to another. Quite the contrary, I'm wanting to say that we need to help level up the entitlements for special guardians. The reasons for why we're not making the best possible use of wider research evidence and the evidence on special guardianship is quite complex and I think we need to understand and learn, learn far more about it. But there seem to be a range of reasons. So one of them is that really we've perhaps been sleepwalking through this amazing transformation in the use of special guardianship as an outcome of care proceedings. And we simply haven't yet caught up with that. Can we now turn to the second slide, please? Thank you. So the first point that I think we need to make here is that when we think about the reasons one of them is, as I say, we've been sleeping, sleepwalking through this. The best practice guidance and other things, we're waking up. But there are other reasons that also perhaps mean we have not addressed the problems within special guardianship sufficiently rapidly. Steve has already alluded to the difficulties and uncertainties in how we value special guardianship. And I would simply like to put that to you as a question. I think perhaps our views are sometimes ambivalent. And then there's a third and very practical reason. And that is that professionals often don't know what happens when the order is made. In the words of one person, who had seen our first film, she commented, and I thought the, that was, once the order was made, that was the end of the story and it was a happy ever after ending. Those words have absolutely resonated with me. And I hope that the films we have just demonstrate that it's the beginning of the issues as well as the resolution of earlier difficulties. So now, what is the way forward? I think that here we have to acknowledge the really important role that the new best practice guidance developed by the Public Law Working Group is a really important step forward. But as the report itself comments, there's a need also for longer term change. What the best practice guidance does is particularly when associated with the implementation and training strategy, is that it's going to ensure a more consistent approach irrespective of where you live. And that is very important. But I think we need to go beyond and we now need a national strategy in England and Wales that names and values special guardianship and removes the disincentives to become a special guardian. Naming is an incredibly important issue because when a, an issue is named, one can respond to it in policy and practice terms. As long as, and Maxine has highlighted this point, education is needed. Many, many people don't know what special guardians do and who they are. So in terms of the research strategy, 
we need a research strategy that provides an effective underpinning to service development and its evaluation. We don't have that at the moment. Our research is piecemeal and compared to the research on other areas such as foster care or um, adoption, we really are at a very early stage. Partly that's due to the fact that it's a relatively new order, but there is a massive agenda. And I just want to pull out a few points as to what we need to do in terms of the research agenda. I think the, key, the first key point is that we need to know much more about what the needs are of children and of their carers. Unless we understand those needs, how can we respond to them in an effective way? How can we develop those services? Some of my wishes are far more modest. It seems to me that it would be relatively easy to flesh out exactly who special guardians are. There's a most, um, I don't want to use the word extraordinary, but perhaps I will say it, lack of basic information. We don't know, we know roughly the proportion that come from families and are provided, the care is provided by relatives. Are they grandparents? Are they aunts, sisters, uncles? We just don't know those answers. We don't know the first thing about ethnicity. Again, all these things matter when we're thinking about what needs to change. So we have a jigsaw puzzle full of empty pieces. There's another thing that we need research on. Several people have talked about contact today and the difficulties. There's recent research being done on contact, but as regards what works well in contact for special guardians, there's a silence, another gap in our jigsaw. So then there's a third point that I want to bring out, and that is that we don't know and this is so important also for you, Josh, we don't know what children think about special guardianship. We need to understand their views and their experiences. This has been called for for many years now. It's still a major hole in our evidence. So what do we need to do? I think that firstly, looking forward, we know that more children will be placed with special guardians. That seems particularly likely in view of the pandemic. But I want to say that firstly, we need to tackle the agenda for change, not in a piecemeal incremental way, but holistically looking across the board. So that national strategy that I mentioned in England and Wales needs to have buy-in from the Ministry of Justice, from the DFE, that's referring to in England, from Family Justice System, ADCS. It needs to be tackled holistically. We also need to be, I think, more ambitious when we're thinking about the leveling up agenda. And that is one of my main conclusions. We need to level up the entitlements and supports for families who have taken a child and are bringing them up as their own. This is not to say that the there are other options that are not equally of valuable the sad fact is special guardianship has lagged behind i would like to see the removal 
of that hierarchy of placement options. I think it can be damaging. So my conclusion would be that special guardianship is a very valuable option, but and the research evidence such as we have it is promising and encouraging and consistent. It provides the scaffolding and the building blocks for effective future thinking about how to prioritize special guardianship, how to support it in the way that we've heard is being done in Leeds and elsewhere. That is my top priority. The simple conclusion is that it makes sense to invest in special guardianship because it is giving children, their families and wider society in the shorter and longer term, a good return on investment. But we have to be as ambitious in our research agenda so that we can develop and evaluate what are effective supports and interventions. That's all I want to say. Thank you, everybody. So now we want to just move straight on to the Q&A. And at this point, I'm going to pass over to Lucy and to John. Well, we, we've certainly had uh, um, a large number of questions raised in the Q&A. Um, I see that 13 of them have been answered, uh, but there are certainly a lot more uh, than that. Um, do, you have a, do you have a sense, Lucy, about the issues that uh, have kind of seemed to run through many of the questions that have been asked and whether they align themselves with what has been presented in uh, by uh, the speakers in the course of uh, this evening's session? There is quite a variety of questions, but I think there is one which keeps coming back and particularly from special guardians in the audience mm. and it's around the point that all of our children with special guardianship orders are vulnerable, mm. but there is a different level of access to support depending on whether those children were previously looked after or not. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of comments uh, from special guardians about that inconsistency of support, uh, the inequality of access to support and what can be done about that. So uh, Harinda, Sinead, Roger have asked questions about that. There's lots of, lots of other people who are asking questions. I think it would be really interesting to hear from Josh, Krish and Maxine about their thoughts about that, um, whether the way that we structured the system is fair, whether, whether the way we structured the system is meaning that some children who really need support are not being able to access that at the moment. So shall I, shall I go to Maxine first? Thank you. Um, I can give you a really short answer to that question, um, Lucy, which is no. Um, and the reason why I say no is that these are children with the, the same types of issues, um, but not the same access. Uh, within my support group, I could have special guardians, uh, public order route, private order route, child arrangement order, with really common theme issues, um, but the access is fraught. Um, and, it, and it becomes quite difficult for me as a project worker sometimes to be able to advertise support that's available, but say, no, actually, but you can't have it. And that is really, really difficult. And, and then the next question is why? You know, isn't my child the same as yours? I mean, I, I think that, that that's a really critical point. These are the same children, uh, whatever the um, order that the court makes in, term, uh, in terms of their long-term future. Uh, but these are, these are children that have been born and have experienced the, the worst of possible starts in life with all the things that come with that. Um, and very quickly, depending on the nature of the order, we divide them into different groups as though they were different children and need different things. 
Um, and uh, and I, you know, I th you've just said it, you just summed it up perfectly, I think, Maxine. But and um, you know, I think it, it was a part of that discussion with Krish that, um, that that we 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 seem to have come up with this view that depending on the order, it kind of seems to determine your eligibility, your suitability, and uh, your right to um, um, access uh, necessary and um, urgent support packages. Yeah, I, I, I agree, actually. Um, I think the challenge, for example, the Adoption Support Fund, as we've agreed, is misnamed. It's the Adoption Support Fund and um, Support Fund for Previously Looked After Children Who Are in Special Guardian Placements, which is not a great name change either. Um, and we're trying to figure out what we can call it. But you're right, you know, that in order for a child to come into care, normally something catastrophic has happened. 70% of the children in care, it's neglect or abuse that have been the issues. And whether they're placed with a kinship carer, a, a special guardian kinship carer, a foster carer or an adopter, they've all had that same early years trauma. Um, you know, my board has got a very specific remit. We're allowed to look at adoption and special guardianship and I get my fingers wrapped when I touch foster care. Um, but I think one of the exciting things um, about Josh's review is trying to look at the whole system. And I wonder if there could be a commitment to, you know, equitable um, support for children, whichever their placement situation is. That could be a really interesting um, mindset shift that we could introduce because it, it's, it is unjust that some children get more support because of um, their particular placement order. So I, I'd, I'd add my voice to that because I think it is absolutely vital that all children get the support that they need. And, it, and it's become such a, a powerful message um, from Maxine um, and you know it's been in the chats, it's been in the question and answers from special guardians themselves that they feel that they're treated differently and um, and that we, you know, and it's not, it, it, I mean, it's also an issue about where you live, your, your local authority or your local area uh, will have their own views about what it's going to provide. And there is clearly diversity in, in that. But, but the issue is that this is an issue about um, uh, public policy that treats every child as the same. And it, it would be really interesting, Josh, if you could uh, just come back on Chris's suggestion that actually the, the independent review does offer an opportunity for us to look at this differently and think about how we support every child. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm very happy to make a broad commitment to do that, Lucy. I'm on, I'm on day 11 leading the review, so I won't go all the way and, and meet Chris's uh, request. I should also say I'm very sorry, but I've got a whiny puppy in the background, so apologies for that. He's been silent the entire time up until uh, up until this point where there's a question. I do think there's um, th th there's a, a point here which reflects a wider problem that I'm hearing about across the review, regardless of the group of children or families that we're looking at, which is that through very good intention and usually a narrower focus on a particular problem, we have layered in complicatedness to this work, um, you know, from beginning to end. And so it leaves often professionals sat in front of a, a young person and a family wanting to help them, needing to navigate a lot of things with unintended consequences. Um, and that is something that we need to address. Um, and as Krish says, you know, with a review like this, looking across the entire children's social care system. Um, I've got this puppy here, sorry. Um, looking across the entire children's social care system gives us a chance to, to get into some of those discussions. So that's very much the intention. Brilliant, Josh. We need Josh, to see the puppy. We've show heard us him. Puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, I think, John, John, have you picked out a question from uh, the, the comments that you've been reading that you'd like to put to other members of the panel? Well, I, I, suppose, I suppose the other, the other one is, that, uh, um, is the issue about the best practice guidance. I mean, um, you know, it, it, here we have um, care proceedings um, and, uh, you know, again, life, life changing also intended to be life enhancing, huge responsibility put on the court 
um, and everybody that kind of works on those care proceedings to make sure that they get it right. Um, but, you know, we have had significant um, questions raised by the courts themselves about um, whether the way that uh, special guardianship orders were made and particularly the issues about um, the assessment of uh, special guardians was, was robust, evidence-based um, and recognised the huge challenge that uh, family members might well be faced when a child is actually placed with them, probably with very little preparation, if any, um, or warning. Um, with an expectation that uh, they quickly get to grips with whatever the child's um, experiences have been, particularly of maltreatment, um, of adjusting themselves to uh, all the routines that we know are um, uh, all too familiar when it comes to 24-7 um, uh, care of a child, uh, understanding and uh, uh, trying trying to reflect on um, how the child has adjusted to uh, maltreatment or neglect. Um, and uh, the court needs to address those issues with insight and sensitivity, and particularly not just to be influenced by um, the completion of care proceedings within 26 weeks. Although that's a legal duty and it's understandable, absolutely why it is, uh, that when it comes to special guardianship, I think that, uh, um, that, it, that it has been recognized by the judiciary and others that it wasn't, this was not working on the best side, on the, in the best interests of children. So the best practice guidance um, is set out to try to give a more evidence informed and experience base um, to the making of an order. Um, I just don't have a sense, and I, th I suppose this is the big question for me, about um, what it takes to, in the rollout of that best practice guidance, to make sure that uh, the making of a special guardianship order um, is robust evidence and experience based. Um, and I think there's, there's something George, should we ask that question of Steve and Mike, perhaps, then? So we've got the best practice guidance, and how do we implement this so that it really delivers the change that we want to see for special guardians? So I don't, maybe, Mike, you would you mind going first, and then we could get the perspective from Steve, from a local authority perspective, too. Um, we're, we're getting the message out, but the Judicial College is undertaking particular training and is using the SGO films that have been produced by Judith, by John and by me, as well as those by the Special Guardians. Um, and what's absolutely key is that the closest scrutiny is given to an assessment. And we've made it plain in the report and in the best practice guidance that yes, there's a 26 week rule to, to complete proceedings, but that's, that is subject to the caveat of where it's fair and just to do so. And what we've equally made plain is local authorities have to be given the appropriate amount of time, usually about 16 weeks, to carry out an evidence-based, robust and comprehensive special guardianship assessment. And what's also crucial is that the, the special guardianship support plan has got to be very detailed, robust, and to provide the support that the special guardian and the children need. And unless there's a pre-existing relationship between the child and the proposed special guardian, the only way you can make sure that it is robust and it meet the, meets the needs of the special guardian and the child is for it to be based on the lived experience of both of them. So it, it's based on what they actually need rather than what some professional thinks they might need. And that's been where I think an awful lot of cases have been going wrong in the past and finally, and I noticed there was some comment made about supervision orders being made alongside special guardianship orders. As far as we're concerned, that's a complete no-no. You don't make a supervision order to make sure services are provided. That's what the support plan is for. And it should contain everything that is needed. Thank you. That's really useful. Um, and I think that the issue about support plans comes up a lot from special guardians. Um, and obviously that's an area where the, there is a role for local authorities. So it, it would be really good to hear from Steve about how local authorities are responding to this challenge around improving support plans that, that live and grow as the children uh, develop and, and their needs change in special guardianship. Thanks, Lucy. I mean, I, I think the, the first 
challenge in terms of getting information out about is, is through the ADCS and through practice and seminars and, and uh, that kind of work. But I think the most important thing for, for local authority and for local authority social workers is the way in which they view and engage with families and that they view family not just simply as the birth family, but the extended family. That if we can get engaged with the extended family at an earlier stage, in terms of helping birth parents to resolve some of the experiences that they have. And when they can't, making sure that we're beginning to build relationships, that we're giving extended families the opportunity to consider among themselves who would be the best person to offer alternative care, then, then you know, because I, the, I think very often we make the assumption, we make two assumptions, I think, very often, and I'm generalising, so apologies if I upset anybody with this. The first is the extended families will know the detail of problems that birth parents are experiencing. And I don't know about anybody else, but let me tell you, even as an adult, when I was having trouble, the last person I ever wanted to know about the trouble I was in was my mum. Yeah. Because while she was a great source of support to me, she'd also, yeah, let me know, yeah, where I had got it wrong. So I think extended families, we assume they know. And sometimes I think there's also a view that we assume they have contributed in some way to the difficulties that families have experienced. And that we're not recognising that the issues that perhaps um, grandparents, yeah, aunts and uncles had when they were younger. And I can remember um, uh, uh, a, a kinship carer being very embarrassed at the fact that I had to sign off, you know, approval for for, and he got a he got a litany of offences that had occurred up until the age he was about twenty three. Yeah, at twenty three, he'd met. His, his partner and had never been in trouble again in another 20 years. But, you know, but that's, so we need to be realistic, I think, in the, in the, in the approach that we're, that we're taking and starting and thinking about when children come into care, yeah, what is the likely route for them leaving? And I also think just to pick up on a point that was made earlier, there is support out there for parents who are, are special guardianship guardians, I think, who don't come in, who come in through the the private rather than the, the public route through Section 17, yet yeah, through child and other, um, child adolescent mental health services, but they're difficult to access. So having something that is dedicated that, that they can access quickly, yeah, and streamlining that would be an incredible helpful thing, yeah, to do. But I think, uh, it, you know, whilst not wanting to intrude in the lives of anyone who wants to be a kinship care, I think a requirement of an assessment, yeah, either through the, the, you know, through the local authority or whatever, you know, where support to consider the kind of support that might be offered might be a good way forward. But I think the main thing to get back to the question you asked is about engaging early with families and, and engaging in a proper way, not doing too or for, but working with. We could have run on for much longer with the Q&A, but as we've all said, this is a beginning and that is a marvellous agenda that's been set out. What we want to do now is to show the film, just the first part which sets out the key priorities. We're delighted to launch this today. It's a film from Lancaster University, Kinship and Quorum Bath. And it's called Special Guardianship, an Agenda for Change, which explains the title of this webinar. We're hugely grateful to the special guardians and others who've contributed to our films and to our filmmaker, Rich Berry. And we very much hope that it's going to inspire the much needed changes that everybody has been talking about today and that special guardians and their children need so urgently. So without more ado, let's now look at the film. Uh, the recommendations of the Public Law Working Group fall in relation to special guardianship orders to two parts. One is those for immediate change and those for longer term changes. 
The longer term changes, for example, providing uh, legal aid funding for prepaid special guardians uh, will require uh, government additional finance or changes to legislation and that will plainly take time. The vast majority of the recommendations, however, can be implemented immediately uh, and those are essentially that there is a thorough and comprehensive assessment of the proposed special guardian, uh, that the child has a lived experience with the proposed special guardian before uh, the special guardianship order is made and that the support plan for the child and for the special guardian is detailed and comprehensive and provides exactly what the local authority are going to do to assist this child and this special guardian. The important message is one size does not fit all and the plan must be tailored to the child and to these special guardians. The Board's priorities start with the first stage, which is the assessment and experience of special guardians in the court process. Uh, second priority is to improve the support that's made available to special guardians and children subject to those orders in school and education. Uh, the third priority is to make sure that going forward, the Adoption Support Fund to be better tuned to uh, provide what needs to be required for uh, special guardianship families. We have not heard the voice of children living with special guardians. We need to know what their experiences are, what worked well for them, what are their issues, so that we can take that on board in practice. We need more research on what works well in contact given that it is one of the most challenging and difficult areas. We need to know what proportion of special guardians are not grandparents. Issues around ethnicity, the sizes of sibling groups that they take, all this should be routine information and we need the Adoption Support Fund to be monitored on a regular basis. So there is guidance for family and friends care and special guardianship. The truth is, it's not enough. There are too many kinship carers who are not getting the support they need. We need the government to introduce legislation and bring funding to local authorities so they can provide the support that these families need. Without it, these children will not do as well as they, can, they could. We need to stop uh, treating kinship care as the same as fostering and adoption. It, it's like putting a square peg into a round hole. Recognise what kinship care is and build a system and support services that work for these families. One of the things kinship carers tell us is that the, the impact of not getting support and having to fight for everything is really detrimental to their own mental and physical health. And what's really worrying is that a third of kinship carers in our survey of over a thousand said that it's so detrimental they are not sure that they will be able to continue as carers. If they cannot continue as carers, if we don't support them to continue, that's a lot of children who are at risk of entering the care system. One hears too often for comfort uh, kinship care and special guardians making this complaint. They feel they're being taken advantage of by the state. The state has turned to them in a panic. The social workers have turned up on their doorsteps and said, look, can you look after these children? Their instinctive reaction as good family members, uh, as loyal aunts, uncles, grandparents, is to say, of course, yes. But then they feel let down. And that is a very serious indictment of the system. I don't criticise the social workers. The problem is they don't have the resources, which they, I'm sure, would like to be able to make available to these families. But it is a very serious problem, and it's getting worse. So I think one can't um, overestimate the importance of a proper process. Not least because a proper process probably saves money down the line. It's a false economy to economise at that stage. But ultimately comes back to this. I mean, are we a decent, caring society? And if the answer to that is yes, 
then these resources have to be found. Um, if the answer is no, uh, then it is shocking. And if the answer is, out of one side of our mouth, yes, we are, but out of the other side of our mouth, by the way, we can't afford it, then that's equally shocking. We as a society haven't yet recognised just how much we owe special guardians and that we really need to be investing in it. I think that we have got to remind ourselves that this is about vulnerable children living in complex circumstances um, and that as a state we have duties and responsibilities and obligations to both those children and to those carers both in the short and in the longer term. Um, I think that the sector has not been uh, focused and driven enough by those issues and that the turning point comes now both with the best practice guidance um, and the fact that we have the evidence that suggests um, uh, that we need to change um, and it now needs to be changed now.